Welcome to the exhibit, Growing America, the Alliance Agricultural Colony in South Jersey. I'm Michael Cagno, Executive Director of the Noise Museum of Art and Curator of this exhibit. This exhibit is brought to you by the Noise Museum of Art, South Jersey Culture and History Center, the Alliance Heritage Center of Stockton, and the Historical Aquarian Society of Vineland, plus countless donors and lenders across South Jersey. This is a story of the Alliance and related Jewish farming communities in southern New Jersey, which had their inception during the initial years of the refugee crisis in 1882 and 1883. Fueled by a desire to escape violence and suppress freedoms and prejudice, Eastern European Jews fled Russia, seeking opportunities to become tillers of the soil and eventually American citizens. Their story, from its roots to the present day, deserves to be widely broadcast. It's an American story with life lessons that resonate both nationally and internationally. And to tell their story is my colleague, Dr. Tom Kinsella. Here we are at an exhibition about farming. We've got a cultivator here. This is not the sort of thing you would have used to plow your full 15 acres, but this is the sort of thing that you would have plowed your backyard for your home garden in. You may not have used a grindstone every day on the farm, but you would use a grindstone often enough to keep the tools that you needed to make your living sharp. Here's just a selection of some of the tools that you might have found on the farm. This is a thistle picker. You don't really want to grab a thistle out by your hands. You use the thistle picker, a scythe. We've got a draw knife. We've got a butcher knife, both of which have not seen that grindstone in decades, I would imagine. Over here, we've got a corn sheller. This was a fancy piece of farm machinery to take the corn off the husk you are growing corn for animals as well as people. This is a mechanical way to uh, take the corn off of the cob. A companion piece, which is the corn stalk cutter. Once the corn has been grown, once you've got the stalks still in the field, you cut them down and you could slice up the stalks for feed for animals. Over here, We've got something that you're going to think is not a farm tool, but it is. Um, early on, the colonists realized in the wintertime you could not farm. You still needed to have income. The philanthropists from New York and Philadelphia were generous enough to give sewing machines to each family or most of the families. And the men and the women would do piecework sewing during the wintertime, trying to increase the income that they had coming in. The story of the Alliance Colony actually starts in Russia. The Jewish population has been living under difficult circumstances for centuries in Russia. In 1881, when Tsar Alexander II is assassinated, that foments pogroms against the Jewish population. Those that could leave tried to leave at that point. There was concurrently a group of Jewish intellectuals in Russia who were coming up with the idea for a back to the land movement called Am Alam. They were thinking one of the best ways to restart our lives is to teach ourselves to farm and move back onto the ground and become farmers. Those people who could emigrate got to Western Europe where philanthropists helped them move to South America and North America and even Palestine. They're taking ocean liners across to New York City where they're landing in Castle Garden. Alice Island isn't gonna be open for another 10 years. Castle Garden is the New York State Emigration Depot. That's where most people come if they're coming from Europe to America. On May 10th, 1882, 43 families came from Castle Garden on a train down to close to Vineland, about five miles northwest of Vineland, a place called Bradway Station. Early colonists remember being dumped off at the train station. They walked with all of their belongings two miles into the woods. 1,150 acres of scrub forest had been purchased for them, 
and they were left at three barracks that they were going to live in communally until each family could begin to work on its own 15-acre farm. The property that they found was partially timbered, lots of stumps, lots of brush. It was a difficult place to imagine being farmland. And these 43 families were told, start to uproot the stumps, start to cut down the trees, we're gonna to begin to farm. In the summer of 1882, these 43 families, plus more families that came by train from Castle Garden, began to cut down their trees. They supposedly cleared 500 acres and began to plant some late summer crops. They had a difficult time because they weren't farmers. There was a gentleman named A.C. Sternberg who was brought from Connecticut to teach them how to farm, and he did show them things like how to fertilize, but he was only on the ground for about six months. After that, in 1883 and 1884, these colonists were on their own. They ran into financial difficulties. They write in a series of articles and letters. They write to the philanthropists in New York saying, we need help, you have to help us. It's winter time and we've got no seed for the spring. The philanthropists would write back and say, we've given you a lot of money. You haven't paid any taxes. You haven't paid anything on your housing that we've built for you. You need to get to work harder. In the back and forth, the darkest days of the colony probably were 1884, 1885. They did manage to learn how to farm well. They did succeed well enough to begin to build their synagogues, build their schools, and progress. If the community members of Norma Alliance of Brotmanville weren't watching or playing baseball, they were probably swimming in the Morris River or in Rainbow Lake or Centerton Lake. We've got lovely images of swimming at the Morris River. We have some video film from the 1930s of swimming in the river as well. Let me tell you briefly a fascinating family story. This is about the Stavitskys. Eli and Riva Gito Stavitsky were one of those 43 original families who settled at Alliance. Eli and Riva had a son named Feschel, Fish Stavitsky, who himself married and had a family. Fish was hoping to farm like his father, but could not get funds from the Baron de Hirsch Fund in order to purchase his own farm, so he went to Philadelphia working at the Baldwin Locomotive Company in order to support his family. While he was in Philadelphia, he was caught in a typhoid epidemic and died, leaving his young wife, his four boys, and his youngest daughter without a father. The Stavitskys stayed with the grandparents on the farm for a year, but eventually that became untenable. What Shifra, the wife, decided to do was to take her oldest grandson and leave him with Eli and Riva Gittel on the farm. She took her three sons and put them in an orphanage in Philadelphia. There's a story that the two youngest Davitsky boys, Barney and Benny, were split from their older brother, Eddie Stavitsky. He was in the upper level of the orphanage, they were in the lower level. 
they were young enough so that when they grew two years older and moved into the upper level, they didn't remember they had a brother. They heard about this guy named Sweeney Stavitsky, who was a great baseball player on the orphanage team, older than them. They loved baseball. When they finally met him, they realized, this is our older brother. The boys were always interested in baseball. Eventually, when they came out of the orphanage and moved back to Alliance with their brother, Jacob, they learned to hunt, they learned to fish. They lived their lives in Eli and Riva Gito's homestead and became essentially pineys. They were um, quite famous as local Indian artifact hunters. Eddie and Barney in particular were able to walk the farm fields and find thousands of arrowheads, which Ben would then plaster into the walls of their home. We, we find these campsites, we could just tell by looking at it whether the Indians camped there or not, with the water. They had to have water. We go and we hunt for water, and, th and then if there's a field that's been farmed around there, we know that's it. Without water, they couldn't live. Right. So that's how we find all our animals. They were a very interesting family. Their homestead was the last original farmhouse built in 1882 for the original colonists. It was eventually taken down in 2004. We've given you a selection of some of the stories that can be found in the Growing American exhibition. There are dozens we haven't told you about, including this chair that came out of the Brotmanville Synagogue. If you want to know more, you can always get a hold of the exhibition catalog. I hope you've enjoyed what we've shown you. If we don't bother anything, we wouldn't pick up a penny of his place. <laughs> We're honest guys, you know, that's the way we were brought up. Um, treat people like you'd like to be treated yourself. And that's the way most of the people from the colony were. They'd help one another in sickness, you know. When somebody got down, they'd pitch in and do his work on a farm, the old timers. I guess a lot of people like that today, but they're hard to come by. Everybody, it seems, is selfish. You know what I mean? They're looking out for themselves. The old timers were a lot different. Thank you. Many people helped to make this exhibition possible. We thank each donor to the Alliance Heritage Center at Stockton University. Without your support, this programming would not be possible. In particular, I'd like to thank Rich Brotman for the use of the newer video footage and Buddy Bardfeld for his father, Leon M. Bardfeld's older video footage. Copies of Growing America in the Alliance Agricultural Colony in South Jersey can be ordered online from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or by contacting the Alliance Heritage Center at Stockton University. Mm -hmm.